And what we're doing is thanking the Lord, number one, for the blessing that he bestowed upon us today. Because he woke us up. He didn't see fit to do that. But he did. And we want to thank him for that, for that blessing. But we know that somebody, somebody did not accomplish that mission today. You know? So give him the, give him the thanks, give him the praise. We also want to thank you for the offering that we received today. Yes. Even though we have a, had, had an opportunity or we didn't have enough to put forth that we would like to put forth in the offering, we know we can have the blessings coming to us so we can do that. Because it's all going for the glorific glorification of the Lord. It's all going for the glorification of the edifice here today. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank him for that. We ask, Father God, that you increase it tenfold. Yes. So that we in turn, Father God, we have enough to go on and continue with your mission, Father God, that you in turn put upon us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, collectively and individually, we all say amen. 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 Holy Father, I want to thank you for bringing us all here today. I want to thank you for the message that you've given me. I hope that it is received by those out in our congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can all be seated, and I'll turn it over to Deacon Keith. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm still on night schedule, so I might be. And you didn't give your name, Chris, so. <laughs> I met this young lady, she came to the neighborhood um, doing the magazine sales that they do during, during the summer. Very dynamic young lady. She's going to be going places, definitely. Well, as usual, the Lord uh, messed my mind up during the week. I already had my idea of what I wanted to do set up. And last night, literally last night, he said, no, <laughs> that's not it. So he gave me something else to speak on. And my topic is going to be suffering succotash. Now what, who, who knows where that, ter that term came from? Safi Duck. Okay, so, and that's where I was, I was literally sitting here watching an old Louis Tunes cartoon. Everyone <laughs> 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 hey, you got the He gave me my message. <laughs> I sat down and watched Daffy Duck suffering, and my question was, why is he getting beat up so much? <laughs> and then I started thinking about the Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. Mm -hmm. Why did they get beat up so much? <laughs> These guys are suffering. Yes, right? So, um, I'm sure everybody has a question as to why people suffer. All right? Uh, and what good can come from suffering? It, there's got to be some good out of it because Amen. we're constantly going through it. Amen. Uh, is it possible to bear, the, bear suffering and still have patience and faithfulness? And how can God give us the strength to endure our hardships and overcome our temptations? Okay? Now, different people deal with different problems and afflictions in different ways. Um, and it seems that some seem to suffer a lot more hardship than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Why? Don't know. For Christians, uh, I do believe that the troubles uh, for ourselves as well as others is a major concern because it can lead to spiritual temptation. All right? we, we start to feel that our trials and tribulations can justify us committing sins. Mm. And that's not necessarily what we want to do. Mm. Not at all what we want to do. Mm. Um, and we may become so discouraged that we start to blame God mm -hmm. for all our troubles. And then we may lose mm -hmm. faith in God or begin to doubt His goodness and His mercy. Mm -hmm. So we really have to understand that, first of all, you're not the only one going through all of this. Right. There are so many others going through it. Mm -hmm. And this is not a story about Job, but this that's the one yeah. person in the Bible who, when I, you talk about suffering, mm -hmm. 
that's the one person who got whipped up besides Christ. Mm -hmm. He got whipped up the most, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so why do people suffer? Um, first of all, let's start with the original suffering. All people are suffering as a result of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. All right. God originally placed Adam and Eve in the state of bliss mm -hmm. with no problems of any kind. You know, skipping through la 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 happy day. <laughs> but he also warned them of the consequences of their sin. Mm -hmm. And when they sinned anyway, he decreed that he would that they would endure pain, mm -hmm. suffering, mm -hmm. hardship, and eventually death. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Genesis 3, somewhere in the vicinity of six, uh, verse 16, you'll find that. And all people since that time have endured these same problems. Okay, in particular, because of Adam, all people die. So Adam is the big troublemaker. Not Eve, everybody thinks it might be Eve, but Adam was given the instruction, and he did not follow the instructions, all right? Uh, much of the suffering that people endure cannot be attributed to any kind of particular sin committed by anyone who is living now, okay? It's just that the common lot of mankind because of sin is in the world. This does not mean, as some people will teach you, that the people today are born guilty of Adam's sin or will be eternally punished for it. That's why we have grace through the Lord. And because Jesus Christ died, we will not be punished if we believe in him, right? But we do suffer in this life because of that, all right? Um, one of the things, sometimes people suffer as a result of their sins, okay? King Saul, for instance, he lived a miserable life and eventually was slain because he had rebelled against God, and that's through First Chronicles, uh, chapter 10, all right? Judas killed himself because he had betrayed Jesus, all right? These are all sins that they've done to themselves. And likewise today, think of, uh, let's say, alcoholics who develop disease, uh, thieves who may be in prison, etc. What you do has a result, okay? And many times that result is a negative result due to the sinful nature of what we do. Um, but there are also times when innocent people will suffer and we don't understand why. All right? This may result from cruelty or accidents. Um, and, and, it's, and something to the effect of when a bystander, for instance, sitting outside and shooting goes off mm -hmm. and somebody gets hit and killed, mm -hmm. all right? A uh, drunken driver killing someone, mm -hmm. okay? So these things are due to someone else's sin, not due to their own sin, all right? In other cases, wicked people may harm the righteous because they resent them, okay? This kind of religious persecution, persecution is all throughout the Bible. Christ is a, is a prime example. A man who did nothing, nothing wrong, no sin, and still was persecuted and killed because of others. All right? In uh, 1 Peter 2, for instance, for uh, uh, 2, uh, verse 19 through 23, in this he says, for this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Mm -hmm. yeah, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. So he didn't give it back. He kept moving on. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. All right? So Jesus is a, a prime example of one who committed no sin at all, yet he was persecuted and killed by wicked men. So we may follow his example and suffer, not for our faults, but when we do good. 
Mm -hmm. Right? So they're suffering when you do good. Uh, John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Mm -hmm. Yet because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Yeah. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Mm -hmm. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Mm -hmm. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So the treatment that Jesus received should warn us of the treatment we can expect. Right. All right? He is the example. So know that it's going to happen. All right? There is one of the things that I, that I like to tell new Christians when they accept the Lord is that they basically opened up the floodgates. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will accept the Lord thinking that all the troubles that they've had are going to go away now that I've accepted the Lord. All they do is make the devil mad mm -hmm. and, they, and they need to know that they're going to have heavy trials and tribulations, probably worse than what they yes. are presently feeling right now. So, and, and that's important to let them know that because that will discourage them if they don't have that knowledge, that will discourage them from, from remaining faithful to God. To God. So, um, in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 to 12, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened, happened to me at Antioch, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution. So all who live godly in Christ expect to suffer. Okay? Now, some suffering is simply a temptation from Satan. And again, Job is the perfect example. And in Job 1, uh, 1 through 2, uh, it expressly states that Job's suffering was a temptation from Satan. He hoped that because he was suffering, Job would turn away from God. All right? So when, when, when Satan is, is in charge, his whole purpose is to remove you from the goodness of the Lord. He wants you to curse God. He wants you to do the things that God doesn't want you to do. He wants you to tell, he wants you to tell God that you don't care for him. You're through. You're done. And God understands when people get angry at him for some things, but he does not expect you to say, I'm done, I'm through. Okay, when you turn away from him, you just open yourself up. All right, some people think that only wicked people suffer, but God is on the side of the righteous, and that God is on the, on the side of the righteous and will remove all their troubles. All right, in the minds of many people, if a person is suffering, he must have committed a sin and needs to repent. Mm -hmm. All right, this was the theory of, of Job's friend in, um, in Job 4, verses 7 through 9. He was telling Job, disproving this idea is the main theme of the book. This same false doctrine is taught by many faith healers who teach people that God must remove all their problems right. if they are right with him. <laughs> okay, so people walk around thinking, that everything is going to be okay because now I am with the Lord. <laughs> okay, we have to learn that even righteous people suffer. And it's important for following reasons. You should not conclude that we have been guilty of sin every time we have a problem. Right. All right? We know that Christ died at many problems. Did he sin? No. All right, there you go. And maybe we're, we are suffering because of sin, so we should examine our lives. So there is a possibility, yeah, we are suffering from sin. But maybe we are suffering for other reasons, perhaps because we are righteous. And that is why we're suffering. Okay? We should surely never reject a Bible teaching just because it, it may lead to suffering. Right, so if it's something that may seem harsh and like, ooh, makes you feel uncomfortable, you may not want to deal with it, but the fact is you need to. Amen. Okay, if all suffering was the result of our own sin, and if a course of action led to suffering, then we would conclude that it was a sinful act. And that's not necessarily true. Yeah. <laughs> if all suffering was the result of our own sin, 
And if a course of action, something we did, led to suffering, then we would come up with the idea that it was a sinful act that we did, because what we did led to suffering. Okay? But we have to learn that godly people often suffer for doing right. So, not every act is a sinful act, and you know that. But you may still suffer from that good act. Okay? And we should not become Christians thinking it will automatically solve all our problems. If this is our motive, we may fall away when the hardship's coming. That's what we were talking about. People wanting to become Christians because, oh, I know, I'm Lord's going to take everything away from me. All these bad things are going to go away. And what ends up happening? You lose your house. You go bankrupt. Your car breaks down. You might even get a divorce. Uh, what else is going on? You start losing your hair. Teeth fall out your face. Whatever. Things just fall apart. And that's because you accepted Christ. And now you're like, man, was this worth it? But it is worth it. All right? And... God should not be blamed for the existence of suffering. All right, if we believe that all suffering results from a person's own sin, and if we see good people suffering, we may be tempted to blame God or to think he is not keeping his promises. All right, but we have to learn that all people suffer whether or not they are righteous. Everyone suffers. The command to endure suffering is just another part of a Christian life. Like the command to study the Bible, to pray, all right, to worship, all of those things. Faithful Christians of all ages have suffered. We are not the only ones, but we should expect suffering to come so our faith will not be shaken when it does. So expect it. If you expect it and it hits you, you won't be surprised. You won't be discouraged. You'll be looking into what can I learn from this. <coughs> Excuse me. The ultimate and primary blame for suffering goes to who? Adam. Satan. Oh! I can answer. Adam. Adam started it, but Satan was the Okay. Okay. So Satan tempts people to sin and thereby brought sin into the world. All right? The secondary blame rests upon people. All right? Ourselves are included. And we give into temptation and we commit sins that lead to suffering. God did create suffering as a punishment for sin, but only after he had given people a life without problems. <coughs> and he had warned them of the consequences. You better watch it. <laughs> and they still went ahead. Remember, if you blame God and reject him because you were suffering, then you were doing exactly what Satan wants you to do. Okay? He has defeated you. He has wrapped you up. The only way to defeat Satan and really overcome hardship is to maintain your faithfulness to God Amen. in spite of Amen. all the suffering. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, you want to know, can suffering have good results? Um, is it good for me that I've been afflicted? Usually when we suffer, we can only see the problems involved. We, surely if we commit sin as a result, then the suffering is harmful. But if we remain faithful, there is a favorable result that can occur. And consider a few of these things. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, as gold is purified by passing through fire, so the genuineness of our faith is proved by trials. Okay? If suffering was limited to sinners and Christians never suffered, all people would want to be Christians, which we would want them to be anyway. But it's not because they love God. It would be just because they can avoid the problems and the suffering. Wow. All right? So they're not being Christians for the right reason. Right. Uh, the fact that Christians suffer too, <coughs> excuse me, means that suffering separates the men from the boys, or the girls from the women. It shows who's willing to remain faithful even when it's hard to do so. Um, suffering also causes spiritual growth. In James 1, 2, and 3, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay? So count it joy when we face trials, because this leads to patience and completeness in God's service. 
Whoever developed patience when his patience was never tried. Who developed patience if your patience is never tried? How do you know when you're going to have patience? Mm -hmm. you got to have, have that trial. Mm -hmm. Okay? In Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out <coughs> in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. All right, so again, tribulations producing perseverance, character, and hope. Rejoice in tribulations because they work steadfastness, approvedness, and hope. So these are some positive things, even in the physical realm, which bones and muscles are the strongest. How many of you with, uh, lift weights here? Or have lifted weights? All right. What bones and muscles are the strongest? No, no. Not, not specifically. <laughs> Well, the bones and muscles that are the strongest are the ones that go through something. Right, ones that are using the That's right. So you have to put put them to a through a trial, yes. through stress, through tribulations, through pain, through suffering, and your result is what? Walk well, around with a puffed up chest, big arms, sometimes a big head. respond to the same thing. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Somebody can lift the same amount of weights that you can and they won't get big at all. Mm -hmm. Alright? Uh, another example would be here. You have a big block of ice and a big old vat of clay mm -hmm. and they're both sitting in a freezer. If you hit them, they're both hard as a rock. Now we take both these items and stick them outside in the sun. Let them sit for a couple of hours. What do you get? A puddle of water. Water. water and still a big brick of clay. Right. All right? Yes. So you have two things exposed to the same, um, the same things and have a different result. All right? So that can happen in every circumstance. All right? Suffering keeps us humble <coughs> and dependent on God. In 2 Corinthians, verses 1, 8 through 10, uh, Fletcher taught Paul not to trust in himself, but in God. <coughs> trust him up with his cough. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. God has repeatedly allowed countries to face wars, famines, and hardships when they become independent mm -hmm. and fail to trust in him. Okay, often this shows people their need for God. And we can see that over in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. Even the people who have been removed out of Egypt back into their homeland. A lot of them still don't believe that Christ has come. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, Paul's thorn in the, in the flesh was a message from Satan that God allowed it to remain because it kept Paul, Paul from becoming too proud over many revelations that he received. So he wants up Paul to get such a big head. Right? From weakness, God can produce great strength. All right? In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph explained that his brothers had mistreated him, but God used that as a means to save the family from famine. All right? So Satan puts trials in our lives to harm us, yet one of the greatest demonstrations of God's power is his ability to take those problems and use them to accomplish good. All right, the greatest example of this is the death of Christ. Satan intended it as a defeat for God and all mankind, yet it ended up as the salvation of all mankind. All right, and that's through 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 24. Now, if you think for a moment of the really important things in your life, how many of them are accomplished without hardships? 
So think about the most important things in your life. How many of them have been accomplished without you going through something? Zero. What's the most important thing that's happened in your life? Right there. Right there. And then you have to go through something in order for him to come? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most women, oh yeah. You be the effort girl. <laughs> okay, so working to care for our families, that's that's important. Now eternal salvation, we have to go through something to get eternal salvation. Suffering is an inherited part of everything good. Alright, there is suffering in everything that's good. Satan. Satan sends trials to harm us, but God can make them come out in the end for our good. But this works only if we remain faithful. Okay, when facing hardships, we may think, I just can't hold out. We may convince ourselves that to expect someone to continue doing what they're doing under the circumstances that you are in right now, uh, without sinning, it's practically impossible. All right? So we end up justifying ourselves for disobeying God. Right. Because this is so hard. There's no way that somebody can can endure this and not sin. Right. It just can't happen. That's okay? But consider that the Bible teaching teaches that we can endure anything. Mm -hmm. All right? God does not put on us more than we can handle. Right. Even when you think it's too much, <laughs> he knows you can handle it. Yeah. You just have to have the faith to handle it. God will not allow you to face a temptation that is beyond your ability to endure. Every temptation will be accompanied by a way of escape. So yes. you can endure it. Yes. Yes. There is a way to get out of it. God will supply your way to get out of it. This means you can endure every trial without sinning. If you think you can't, what God says to do, if you think you can't do what God says to do, or if you ever justify disobeying God, you have believed the devil's lie. That's mm -hmm. it. That's All right, he's whispering in your ear and telling you, nah, you can't do that. Just like he tried to tempt, tempt Jesus. That's it. Yes. You know, Amen. all this I'll give to you. Amen. Amen. Jesus just laughed at him. I already own it. <laughs> 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 I know he's probably looking at us. Like, <laughs> many in, in Psalms 34:19 it says, "Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all." God may not remove all the afflictions, but He makes sure that we're able to endure them faithfully, and that's every one of them—not just a few, but all. In Romans 8:35 to 39. No temptation or trial can separate us from God. In them all, we are more than conquerors. All right? If we endure the temptation without sinning, we would just be conquerors. All right? But we're more than conquerors. That's right. And that's because the problem can actually make us better people. So we are more than conquerors. Not just getting through it, but developing and building ourselves up from it. Okay, not only does the Bible promise that we can endure faithfully, it gives us examples of many people who did so. Okay, in James 5, verses 10 and 11. You want to talk? Come on. <laughs> Job and the Old Testament prophets are, are fine examples of suffering. They, and who in the Bible has suffered more than Job? Amen. No one other than Christ, all right? Uh, Paul suffered great hardship for the Lord, and we should share in those sufferings if we endure without for, um, failing the way. <coughs> he is, he's the example we should imitate as far as New Testament example. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, Jesus and, a, and the faithful Old Testament characters are witnesses to what we can do under trying circumstances. Our temptations are no worse than theirs. All right. All these examples show that God will keep his promises to help his people endure faithfully. 
And what blessings will God provide to help us endure? Mm, so we know there are blessings. Okay, God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in trouble. And that's from Psalms 46.1. God has promised to help us endure, but we must take use of the help he provides. All right, let us summarize a few of the ways God helps. The Bible. In Romans 15, 4, <laughs> through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. Okay, we have already learned several ways the scriptures comfort and strengthen us when we are suffering. Mm. They help us understand that we will have to suffer, but good can result from our suffering. Amen. <clears throat> amen, amen. They give us assurance that we can endure like others. Mm. They give us evidence of God's wisdom, his power, and faithfulness to his promises. This strengthens our faith that God can and will help us endure. Mm -hmm. But the Bible gives us none of this help unless we do what? Study. Study. Exactly. If you don't read it, you're not going to know what the Bible says about it. All right? People think it's just going to be osmosis. I put my hand on it and it's going <laughs> to suck up through my fingers and right into my brain and I will know it all. Yes, with it under your belt. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Okay, in James 5.13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? <clears throat> Let him pray. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything be prayer, be, by, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Mm -hmm. In Job 1 to 20, when Job suffered, he went to God in worship. Far too often when we suffer, what do we do? We close up and hide. We run away. All right? We don't want to be bothered with anyone. We neglect to worship because we don't feel like it. You know, I don't feel like it today because I'm sad. I'm hurt. You know, you have got to go to the Lord when you are when you are suffering. He knows you're suffering, and he can provide the comfort you need. That means opening up this. Turn to a page and read. Bless you. Okay, these passages do not promise that God will remove our problems. It doesn't say he's going to take, take them away. But they do promise that he will provide strength we need to be faithful despite the problem. Jesus and Paul both prayed about problems and God answered their prayers. But the problem was not removed. Okay, instead God gave them strength to endure and go through it. Um, in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, not only can God comfort us, so can other Christians. And we should strive to comfort others. Amen. Right? Amen. So we are, as a group, we should be comforting each other mm -hmm. and comforting even those who are not Christians. I mean, it's, it's everybody talks about Christians comforting Christians, but everyone should be comforted. Right. Okay? In Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens. We should never allow another Christian to suffer alone through serious problems mm -hmm. if there's any way that we can help them. All right? And one of the best places to get encouragement in time of trouble is your public worship, which is your churches and your congregations, mm -hmm. even small home meetings, Bible studies, whatever. When you are surrounded by other Christians and you have a problem, you have a, a community to go to to help with a collective mindset. Mm -hmm. right? um, in Romans 8, 16 through 18, we are heirs of God if we suffer with Jesus. The sufferings of his life are unworthy to even be compared with the future glory awaiting us. So it's coming. Some people don't want it too soon. I understand, but it's coming. James 1 uh, verse 12, the man who, who endures is blessed because the result will be a crown of life. All right? So in conclusion, Faithful Christians will suffer. Unfaithful Christians will suffer. Non-Christians <laughs> will suffer. We will all suffer. 
Yet, the Christian's life is still the best because only faithful Christians have the assurance that we can endure, mm -hmm. that God will help us, Amen. that the result will be for our own good, yeah. Yeah. and that in the end, we will have eternal life. All right. May the Lord have a blessing on his work. Amen.